Hi, hello, welcome to Lizzie Creative. I am super thrilled you're here on my channel because I am still producing, filming, editing my 12 days of Christmas content, which so far I have posted like six days in a row while I'm filming this and I think I'm gonna post tomorrow. So that means like it's on track and I've never posted content day after day in a row. So I am impressed with myself. Okay, somehow I'm ending 2020 on a really creative streak. Let's keep it going into the new year. Anyway, all of that to say, I'm thrilled to talk about 20 of the best books I read in 2020 and I had to keep this list a little bit near, like a little bit edited. I wanted to pick books from across multiple genres and not just young adult fiction even though I read tons and tons of YA books and authors. I wanted to talk about all the, a lot of different kinds of books I read. So unfortunately, even though there's some really great YA books I read this year, I could only pick a few for this list. So this is the cream of the crop list, even with my nonfiction reads, because I read 12 nonfiction books, but I couldn't talk about 12, all 12, because that would mean only eight left in this video. Anyway, that is a lot of rambling thoughts about how I took many hours to edit this list and it's now coming at you. So let's roll the intro. Let's get started talking about our 2020 faves. Also, this is a total accident, but I'm wearing the exact same sweater that I wore for my 2020 worst books of the year video, but it's an it's like 15 days after I filmed that because I filmed that earlier in December and now it's after Christmas and I'm wearing that sweater but I'm wearing a different necklace and I'm wearing earrings today and I have different makeup so maybe I'll look different enough that nobody thinks it was filmed on the same day if not whatever I do not have the energy to go get into a different sweater and refilm the intro so we're just gonna roll with repeat outfits because yeah for the start, let's start with my favorite nonfiction reads of the year. So my very, 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 very best nonfiction book that I read this year was Know By Name by Chanel Miller. And this is a memoir from the survivor of the Stanford assault case. And her case went viral when she posted her victim impact statement on BuzzFeed. And everyone was so shocked that the Stanford swimmer, not only did he assault a woman, but then he was only sentenced to something like three months in jail. And he was sentenced after she read this incredibly powerful statement in court about how surviving the assault had changed and affected her life, her family life. Like it had really, she was a victim of sexual assault. It really impacts you. So she read her statement in court and then Brock Turner was only sentenced to like three months. It was absolutely a sham of the justice system. Anyway, know my name though is beautiful it is the story her in her own words like what happened how she chose to share her story surviving moving forward and becoming a stronger person while maintaining her sense of self and since i have survived sexual assault and i feel like i relate to chanel miller because chanel talks about how she's a quiet person when it comes to like speaking up for her own self and she survived by relying on her own like kindness courage and like strength and as a person who has gone through a lot and maintained my own sense of optimism and hope even in like hard hard times i really related to chanel miller talking about like maintaining her own identity as a person who is not jaded and embittered and how you survive by being like the what who you are it was so beautifully written and i don't think i could ever give it the justice it deserves like i just can't um and i have posted this paragraph on my instagram several times so good that i keep resharing this paragraph from her book because in my opinion this paragraph sums up what it taught me and how it like it resonated with me so i'm gonna read this paragraph um yeah because this is the reason this book is the number one best book I read in 2020. I survived because I remained soft, because I listened, because I wrote, because I huddled close to my truth, protected it like a tiny flame in a terrible storm. Hold up your head when the tears come, when you are mocked, insulted, questioned, threatened, when you, when they tell you you are nothing, when your body is reduced to openings. The journey will be longer than you imagined. Trauma will find you again and again. Do not become the ones who hurt you. 
stay tender with your power. Never fight to injure, fight to uplift. Fight because you know that in this life, you deserve safety, joy, and freedom. Fight because it is your life, not anyone else's. I did it, I am here. Looking back, all the ones who doubted or hurt or nearly conquered me faded away, and I am the only one standing. So now the time has come. I dust myself off and go on. And reading that, I still reduced to tears today. Um, and I remember just like crying over this book in January or February when I read it earlier in 2020. Because it's one survivor sharing their story. And as a survivor reading that, her story gives me hope again. Okay, moving on to book number two. I think this will be a little less tears in talking about this book. I hope so. This book was recommended by Lena Norms, who has a beautiful channel. I always love her YouTube videos, and it's supposed to have encouraged me to be vegetarian. Supposed to have being in quote marks. Anyway, I'm talking about We Are the Weather by Jonathan Safran Foer, and for like a month after reading this book, I did become a vegetarian. But then I started dating someone who was not vegetarian, and it was extremely hard to like make meals, like do things with them if they were going if they were eating me and like I'm cooking for them, like how do I do that? Um, so I ended up putting my vegetarian plans on pause, but maybe in 2021 I will be much more vegetarian. But anyway, We Are The Weather is really good. It talks about the climate crisis and how it should motivate us to change our lifestyle habits to help the planet cope with what's going wrong with the world. And while most greenhouse gas emissions and like the problems with the planet come from like major corporations who abuse the earth's resources. It also goes back to each of us. And if we really believed in climate change and that it was devastating humanity, we would be out there like protesting and risking our lives to change it because we would we would be scared. And honestly, I need to reread this book and be reminded how desperate the planet needs us to act. So this is one of those books I want to eventually own along with Know My Name because I don't own Know My Name yet. And I want to own both of these books and <laughs> reread them because they're both so good. But I want to reread Know My Name to like put me to <laughs> that's my therapy. <laughs> know My Name is therapy and We Are the Weather is an action plan that I need to get out there and be a better steward of the Earth's resources. So yeah, that's why it's in my top two books of 2020 is a book that is therapy and a book that encourages me to act in a as a productive member of society. Like what more can I ask for my best books of 2020? Alrighty, <laughs> book number three is a book I read during June and I read it for my Juneteenth, Juneteenth reads and it's stamped from the beginning by Ibram X. Kendi. You know, oh wow, this book is so good. This book discover, like, explores the history of racism in America and its impact on our culture. So it discover, explores like how it impacts like the way we tell our stories, the laws that were created, our justice system, our constitution, like all of that and like the history of racist ideas because it's not just, you know, I don't want my daughter marrying a black man or I'm going to turn a blind eye as African Americans are lynched and they're enslaved. Like it's not just that, but even the the people who went out to do good in this world, like one of my heroes, I'm going to be a real nerd here. <laughs> one of my heroes is William Lloyd Garrison who started the Liberator newspaper um, and he was like, a go-getter. When he started his newspaper, he said, I will, like, you can try to shut me up, but my goal in life is to end slavery. And I'm going to do, like, bring hellfire and brimstone through my newspaper until slavery is ended. And he was a champion for abolition. But when it came to treating black people as the equals of white people, he kind of fell short. So even our heroes are affected by racism. And I shouldn't say affected. I should say they're infected. <laughs> um, because racism is a blight. It's a disease that seeps into your subconscious and really affects the way that you interact with other people and how you vote, how you engage in your community, how you talk about the folks who live around you. And when you're sitting back not working, how you relax, like how you ignore the problems in the world to just focus on yourself and your own like life and ignore you know, the problems that exist that are related to racism. So, um, stand from the beginning, 1010 recommend, number three, best book of the year. 
and I'm really ranking these like really I, I guess I am ranking these like I wasn't expecting to go like this was number one this was number two but I kind of am because I just listed like my top three best books of 2020 so if you want to read anything that I read this year that you haven't read yet these top three are the books that I would most throw at you and tell you to go read. <laughs> Book number four, also a nonfiction read, is Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race by Renee Edo Lodge. And this book is written by a British black author and <laughs> this book is so good. If you have the audiobook, it's a really great lesson because the author reads it. And this book is a sledgehammer to your subconscious bias. It just really takes all the thoughts you have on the way we interact with our communities and like subtle racism that affects us and how we just like let it slide and it takes a sledgehammer and is like all those things you things you've heard those like myths about the black community and myths about people of color well here's the facts and not only is it the facts but there's like actual stories about how your bias and racism is hurting communities of color now this book is based in Britain and it is really about the British black experience but as an American reader, I was moved. And I think we often think of racism as an American thing, like Americans owned slaves and Americans, you know, did all this bad stuff. And Martin Luther King Jr. was in America fighting racism. But racism is a global problem. And anti-black biases and anti-black laws, they go way back. And the reason they impact the American system is America is colonized by people from Europe who were racist. This book just takes a sledgehammer to a lot of preconceived notions and you walk away changed for the better i would hope i just recommend this author i really need to read more of their writing um and it's number four best books of 2020 because it's that good okay book number five let me look at my list i think it should be a non-fiction book oh yes book number five is the first book non-fiction book I read in 2020 and it is Becoming by Michelle Obama and this is a memoir of Michelle Obama's life written by Michelle Obama. If you listen to the audiobook it is read by Michelle Obama and you know I have no reason to like talk to you about why you should read this book because if you're interested in Michelle Obama you will go read this book. She's the wife of a president and she's a girl who grew up on the south side of Chicago who came from a family who was like living paycheck to paycheck. Her dad was disabled and her family was just like the descendants of American slaves. They moved north during the Great Migration North. Um, they experienced like racism consistently and constantly and she became the first lady of the United States. So her story, I it's just like, there's stars in my eyes y'all. Like I, Michelle Obama is so inspiring and I, cannot fathom what she, her life means to so many people in, from communities where she grew up and like the way she was raised and who she is and what she stands for. Anyway, phenomenal audiobook, phenomenal, phenomenal person. I adore Michelle Obama and really her writing is just, it's easy to understand, it is poignant and it is powerful. Okie dokie. Now we move on to adult fiction and I started reading adult fiction in 2020 which I haven't re hadn't really read that much before but you know I started this year and it was a great year to start. So coming in at number six for best books of the year in adult fiction was The Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires by Grady Hendrix and would I have ever guessed at the start of 2020 that I would put a book, a, a book about vampires, a horror book, and like a Halloween themed book Am I best books of the year? No. No. We would never ever have guessed that this was going to show up in our best books of the year. I didn't even think I was going to read this book, but I wanted to read something that was spooky and scary for Halloween. It was on Hoopla. The audiobook is well narrated and I got swept up into this story. It is really good. It is suspenseful. It is a commentary on how we ignore women and we ignore people of color. How white men can get away with anything and yeah it's so good. Like I cannot recommend it enough and it's also set, I live in South Carolina, it is set in South Carolina and even though I don't like football, the way football plays a role in this story is so true because I live here. I understand when I go get my hair cut and they can only talk about USC versus Clemson, I realize I am the lone 
I'm the sore thumb, the gay person who doesn't care about football in the South. Yeah, I, I'm the one who's out of place, not this community around me. So um, that being a central part of the story is um, hunting vampires on the night of USC versus Clemson game. That really stood out to me and was just one of the funniest details in the book that I loved. Anyway, I, I like this book. I want to throw it at people and be like, if you're looking for an adult fiction, that will change up like your reading style and like the pace of what you read and you want to be on the edge of your seat for 90 percent of a book go read southern book club's guide to slaying vampires because it is that book book number seven on this list is pachinko by minji lee and would i have put this on my like what i thought would be my favorites of 2020 no but when it's not published this year like it didn't have to be published this year for me to read it but it's like an older classic book I'm actually gonna look when it was published. 2017. So I have been sleeping on Pachinko. And Pachinko is basically an instant classic. It is a multi-generational story about a family who is from Korea and eventually moves to Japan before World War II. And there are just life struggles and stories and what it means to be displaced from your own culture and your own people and like growing up as an outcast in a different a foreign land and it is soft and cutting and poetic and absolutely stunning like that it's a sweeping story that you cannot put down that's how i would describe pachinko and if you're looking for an a classic book that is modern and yet old at the same time i would recommend pachinko if it's not on your tbr please go put it on your tbr and please read it because you won't be able to forget it. Okie dokie. Book number eight is a book that I want to rave about for a long time and that is Black Sun by Rebecca Roanhorse. And Black Sun is a South, 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 South American inspired native indigenous fantasy. So it's about a boy who is an avatar for the crow god, a siren, and a, the priest of the sun god. And there are three different lives colliding. That's how I'm gonna describe it. And it is pre-European colonization. I was just blown away by this book. Like there is no other words to describe it. I started listening to the audiobook and I liked it so much that on page 70, I picked up the ebook. I do not like reading ebooks. I would either listen to the audiobook or read a paperback in my hands, but I wanted to read these words, not listen to them. I wanted to actually see them on the page because I was into this book and I read it all in one night, could not stop reading it. There was a live club for this book and I wanted to hear other people talk about it. So I went to the live club and was like, yes, this book is good <laughs> and confirmed it's amazing. And um, I cannot wait for the second book in the series. Every time I see someone post a Goodreads review of this book or mention on social media that they're reading it, I want to stand around and clap and applaud because this book deserves more readers. Black Sun is just, it's something else y'all. Like there's no way else to describe it. It so subverts my, my expectations. Like I didn't know what to expect at all. I didn't know who to root for, who was good, who was bad. I, it was like morally gray to the extreme and so many different things happening that it really kept fooling me. So yeah, I cannot wait for the second book. I can't wait to read more Rebecca Roanhorse and I can't wait to go out and reread this book too because I will need to reread it before the sequel comes out. Alrighty, book number nine is a book that I knew I needed to finish before the end of 2020. Otherwise, it wouldn't be able to make it in my best books of 2020 video and that would have been very upsetting to me because I knew it was going to make it in, like I knew before picking up this book, it was going to be one of my best reads of 2020 and that is the Burning God by R.F. Kuang, and gosh y'all, it's so good. Um, so The Burning God is the last and final book in the Poppy War trilogy. It is fast paced, it is, I don't have the words, like I do not have the words for this trilogy. I was so upset when it ended because the ending really wrecked me, and it is, it's just too good. Like it's too good to be true. It's that kind of book. And I'm gonna 
never forget it that's all i can say i did film a whole reading vlog where i read the last hundred pages on camera so i literally was like sitting here in my living room reading so my whole reaction to the end is on that reading vlog if you want to check it out it's posted as part of my 12 days of christmas videos and i got the hard copy of this book because there was only a hard copy available but i have the first two books in paperback and i will eventually when the paperback comes out get the final book in paperback so then i will give away the hardback but yes i cannot wait to own this entire series as a paperback trilogy because it's just that good and it, it's i hate having two paperbacks and a hardback to complete the trilogy but that, i am glad i bought it and read it though i'm really glad i read it in 2020 slightly salty my library didn't have it ready for me but you know we're glad we went out and got it we read it we wept we cried <laughs> We wept and cried, same words, we screamed, and we ranted, and we're gonna go reread the trilogy probably in the next six months. I think I'm, I want to reread The Puppy War from beginning to end and just be amazed by this the story that R.F. Kuang wrote, because it's so good. Moving on to young adult fiction. I read so much young adult fiction, it was really hard to pick just a few for this list, but your girl tried as hard as I can, or could, or can can i don't know which verb of that to use anyway i don't know why i say i'm a writer because verb tenses yes. okay so young adult fiction book number 10 is grown by tiffany d jackson this was so good i cannot begin to describe how good grown was and i say that about all these books because they're the top 20 best books of the year like how are you supposed to really describe them well enough they deserve better than what i can do for them so Grown is about a young teenager who is caught up in the like aura of an R&B singer and then she wakes up one day and he's dead and she's accused of murdering him. So this story is overlapping two timelines between when he is tricking her into falling into his orbit and then after his death like the reaction and the trial and just like how the world is responding to this beloved R&B singer who is actually a predator. If Tiffany Jackson writes books that feel like they are directly taken from headlines, in some cases they are and Grown feels that way. Tiffany D. Jackson said this book is not based on a particular singer, it's not based on a particular survivor or victim. This book is based on her experience as a black woman and how often black women's voices and when they come forward is sidelined and ignored in favor of how men want to view it, how white people want to view it, how the culture wants to view their story. And I think that is what's most upsetting is you get angry and upset that no one is believing the girl in Grown. Like it's so frustrating and that no one's believing her, but you know this is fiction and in real life this is happening to BIPOC women and girls all over the world. So I think that is why this book is so unsettling and yet good at the same time. Is it because it reminds you that it's completely based in true life experiences and yeah Tiffany D. Jackson just took it out of the park again. Like every one of her books is a 10 out of 10 and this one is like a thousand out of 10. Book number 11. <laughs> I'm just, this is actually three books, but, but we're going to count it as one. So this year I reread The Hunger Games Trilogy by Suzanne Collins. And y'all, this book was, these books are so good. I love them all. I really have no words, qualms, problems with Mockingjay. I know that's kind of unpopular, but I, this entire trilogy is from top to bottom, very poignant, very rich, and very political and I think that's why I liked it is it's because it's so political but in the same way it's Katniss Everdeen's story so Katniss Everdeen isn't trying to live a political life she's not trying to save the world and stop President Snow she's just trying to live her life save her sister and have peace and that just is ruined and taken away from her and we as the readers are taken on that journey and I so appreciate how Katniss did not set out to, she's not the chosen one. Um, she's just an average person doing like she thinks is right and the world comes, falls apart around her. So yeah, I 
I read The Hunger Games when I was a teenager, like so many other people, and I liked it. I liked Katniss, I liked PETA, I liked <laughs> Finnick O'Dear, I liked the whole story, but I didn't appreciate the deepness of the political themes and how classic they are and how this book will last a long time on its own. Like it doesn't need the movies to be a classic, it doesn't need all the fans. It is a classic all on its own because it's that good of a storytelling device, like it's so good as a story. The storytelling is just out there but um i grew to appreciate it even more and honestly one of the best decisions i made in 2020 was to reread these books and if you haven't read these books in years or you never ever read them in the first place take my advice go get them sit down and read the hunger games Alrighty, book number 12 is clap when you land by Elizabeth Acevedo. And Elizabeth Acevedo, this is her third book, and she's written one other verse in verse, one other book in verse, and one other regular YA novel. And this is a YA book told in verse by two different sisters, one who lives in New York and one who lives, I believe, in the Dominican Republic. Pretty sure it's the DR, but you know, maybe I should look at that. Yes. It is the Dominican Republic. Anyway, so it's two different sisters and they are don't realize they're sisters and their father travels back and forth between New York and the DR every year and spends most of the year in New York City, spends some time in the summer in the DR. And they are brought together when their father's plane crashes and he dies on the plane. So it is it is it's a tragic book. It is grief filled, it's it's hard it brought me to tears and it is beautiful as all of Elizabeth Acevedo's books are they're just absolutely stunning inside out like you can't look away from the beauty of her words and I really liked Clap When You Land and it, it felt like it was kind of hyped when it came out like everybody was talking about it but I'm not seeing it on many best book I am not seeing it on many like list wrap-up videos so if you haven't picked it up go read it because it is in my top 20 books of 2020 and it's just a classic it it, it like all of her books it deserves a place on your shelf that's what I'm gonna say about it book number 13 we're still in young adult fiction and I'm gonna mention Felix Ever After by Case and Calendar a summer read about a trans demi boy in New York falling in love for the first time discovering more about his own identity and who he is and his friendships what they mean to him what his family means to him and just coming to terms with being themselves subverting expectations of people around them there and and just like being not only like when i say proud i don't mean just like oh i'm glad to be gay or i'm glad to be trans but like actually like taking pride in that fact so i really liked this book <laughs> like Felix Ever After is so good I also really like that it is messy Felix makes decisions that you will disagree with that you're like like are were you thinking because that's a bad decision but that's what teenagers discovering themselves do we we I'm not a teenager but I was we make bad decisions and you know sometimes there are consequences to those decisions and you can't change them like once you've made that decision you have to you have to work through it you have to go through that road that you've decided to take and that's what felix ever after like really explores that does not shy away from like the messiness of being a person and that's why i it's on my top 20 books of 2020 because it just is it's just that good so if you haven't read it put it on your list go pick it up go read it don't wait don't pass go don't collect 200 dollars who is collecting $200 these days. But anyway, go read Felix Ever After. Number 14 is Surrender Your Sons by Adam Sass. And this book is a YA, YA thriller. And I didn't know YA thrillers were a thing. Actually, maybe I did. I think I just didn't pick them up. I don't know, but it is a YA thriller. And it is the kind of thriller that is hard to read, but it has a good ending. And that is so important to me in books that feature LGBTQ characters is that they have a good ending and that we don't kill the gays trope. I don't like that trope. It's awful. Don't do it. Dog barking. I hope you didn't hear that. Anyway, so Surrender Your Sons is about a teenager who comes out to his mom. And she's like not a fan 
um, she's religious and doesn't want him to be gay, so she ships him off to conversion therapy. And at conversion therapy, there's a lot of mystery going on, there's a lot of, of course, it's a mess, these people are bad who are running this conversion therapy, and the kids involved aren't taking this standing down. They're gonna stand up and fight for their rights to be who they are, and as they do that, there are, there are bad things that happen. So I really like Surrender Your Sons. I read it all in one night, could not put it down. I think I finished it like two in the morning, but it's that good. And I don't know why more people haven't read it. Like I'm seriously confused why it's not in everyone's top 10, top 20, top 15 of the year, because it's a really good story. Like it is a story about survival and hope and yeah, who doesn't want to read that? So yeah, I keep saying so yeah, that's my catchphrase today. So yeah, anyway, moving on. But if you haven't read Surrender Your Sons, go make a point to do it because you need to. Book number 15 and the last of our young adult fiction books is, um, <laughs> sorry, I was like, it went out of my brain. I couldn't think of it for a second. Is A Song of Wraiths and Ruin by Roseanne Brown. And this is a young adult fantasy. So I've given you a contemporary, a poetry YA book, a thriller, a classic series, The Hunger Games, you know. And now I give you a fantasy. So <laughs> I present to you the best fantasy of 2020 that I read for young adult readers was A Song of Wraiths and Ruin. It's just that's good. It's just that good. It is what it's written inspired by West African folklore and it stars two characters who are a, a princess and a refugee and they're destined to kill each other in order to save the ones they love. I love that synopsis. I don't care if that's if there are tropes involved because the tropes are subverted folks the tropes are really really subverted here and i like both characters i like karina the princess and i like malik the refugee they're both really good they both grow so much in the story and the lore the fantasy the magic system it is deeply developed and really intriguing to me. I really want a huge map of this world that I could just hang on my wall and study. I would like a book about the religion governing this universe because I don't know that much about it. And I look forward to exploring the religious themes like of this world and universe and like how it runs in the second book, um, which is coming out in 2021 and I cannot wait for it. So yeah, I have talked about A Song of Race and Ruin a lot because it is that good. It's amazing. It's one of the best YA fantasy books I read in 2020, which is why I ended up at number 15 on this list. And I want to throw it at everyone because if you haven't read it, you are missing out. So go read it. Now, I'm kind of excited about this because I've never divided this, these kind of books into a category, but we're doing that today because these books deserve a category. Um, and I've never talked about these kind of books in my end of the year wrap up mainly because I think I was told many times that these kind of books were like embarrassing to read so I just never talked about them. I'm also tired of this backdrop so we're gonna switch the camera around to talk about these books. I mean it's not switched that much but it is switched enough that I'm not annoyed with it so there you go. Anyway, what, what category am I talking about? Have you guessed? Anyway, I'm talking about adult romance books and these could be new adult or adult. I'm just gonna like combine them into one category because I kind of think adult can go for new adult. Like I think they're the same thing. Anyway, um, publishing needs to figure out how to categorize books better. Best adult romance books that I read. <sighs> yes, here they are. Number one, number 16 in this list. Thank you, refrigerator. Number number 16 in this list is Written in the Stars by Alexandria Belfour. I just read this in December. It is a new adult holiday romance featuring two female main characters who are fake dating for the holidays. What? Like, go read it. Who, who could want more than fake dating over the holidays in Seattle, may, might I add, I've never been to Seattle. It's on, it's like huge on my bucket list and I wanna go. Also, one of the main characters is a redhead. Now, she is the opposite of me, but uh, in a lot of ways, and I actually relate to the blonde main character more because she has the same name as me and 
I just related to her a lot. I related actually to both characters because the one is a redhead, I related to her. I'm like, oh, I'm a redhead. But I related to the attitude, personality, and desires in like deepest fears of, <laughs> of Ella. Anyway, I related to her so much. I'm pretty sure she's an Enneagram 3 or 4, and I am an Enneagram 3 wing 4 most of the time. Sometimes I think I go wing 2, but I'm mostly a 3 wing 4. And I just related to her so much that this book really hit me where I needed and reminded me that I am worthy. Like, even if other people don't respect the work I do and like who I am as a person, I am worthy of love. That will happen eventually. Someone will love me for who I am and life is okay. Like life will work out. And that's why I just, I guess it hit me in the right time I needed in my life. And it's a female love story, which we don't often get like a female female love story and I just really appreciated it for that and I feel like I could talk about this book for a long time because I liked it so much um but I'm gonna wrap this up and say if that any of that strikes you as something you would want to read or enjoy um to go pick it up it, it, it is my top 20 books of 2020 and if you had told me two years ago I would have been putting a lesbian slash bisexual romance on my top 20 books of the year list I would have not believed you because back then I was closeted back then I was terrified of anybody thinking that I was gay by watching my YouTube and here I am today not closeted telling you this so I that's just like that's what we call character development moving on adult romance number two book number 17 on this list is The Wedding Date by Jasmine Guillory hey it's editing me and I feel like an absolute idiot because I say The Wedding Date because that's the first book that Jasmine Guillory has written that I haven't even read. I've just heard good things about it. But I totally mean the proposal, which you saw on the graphics of this video, that I meant the proposal. So, you know, it's 36 minutes into this video, so maybe most people have stopped watching, so this won't be as embarrassing. But yes, I am talking about the proposal. Jasmine Guillory's second book in the Wedding Date series. There you go. I really loved The Wedding Day. It is a, it's set in LA, which I really like the LA vibes. It was a perfect summer romance, but I do remember the main character gets proposed to at a Dodgers game by her boyfriend. And she's like, dude, we've only been dating for like three months. Why are you proposing to me? So she stands up and walks out on him and like that goes viral. And then this other guy is like, oh my gosh, like that's awful like watching this unfold and he comes to her rescue because she's like getting mobbed by people as she's like trying to leave the stadium and this is not going well so he steps in to help and they bump into each other and the rest is history because sparks fly and i think they both say it's a relationship that's just supposed to be about having fun but as they develop feelings for each other like it gets like like that is miscommunication between the two of them because they just want to just be both having fun and then it becomes more than that and they neither one are ready for that and so it's a book it's like very like being an adult in your 20s maybe your 30s like what are you looking for in a relationship and like talking about that looking for a partner who works for you and with you and just like figuring it out and i liked that i liked the idea of figuring that out with someone and like not running from what you need in this life in a relationship because sometimes relationships are scary and you want to run from them and other times you need to like buckle down do the hard work and work it out together and that's what i liked about the proposal it's about two adults like figuring out how to do that in a way that works for both of them anyway moving on i only have three more books I could talk about on this list so the I had to figure out like what was going to be the best books to round out this list so I have two graphic novels and let's see no I have three graphic novels to finish up this list I don't need this to finish up this list because I know these graphic novels maybe I need it to look at the authors we'll see anyway graphic novel number one which is book number 18 on this list is On a Sunbeam by Tilla Walden and I keep talking about this book because it is that book. It is so really good. I'm snapping for emphasis. Can't you tell? Anyway, On a Sunbeam, sci-fi in space, female-female main relationship as like the core of the story, a whole cast of very diverse characters all around this spaceship. They're taking on the world and or the galaxy, the universe, you know what I mean and I love this graphic novel. It's 
it's thick. It's a thick graphic novel. And I think that's why I also loved it is it really felt like reading a 500 page book because it was a 500 page book and I want to see an animated adaption of Anna Sunbeam with Tilla Walden's art because her art is beautiful. It's just gorgeous. Graphic novel number two, book number 19 on this list, is Laura Dean Keeps Breaking Up With Me. I didn't think I would need my iPad, but then I can't remember the author's like exact name, so I do need an iPad. Ooh, I'm also getting hungry, so my um, blood sugar has dropped, which means my ADHD is like raving, and I don't know why my ADD is related, but I literally just put in on a sunbeam in the search bar instead of Laura Dean keeps breaking up with me. So I'm telling you, when my blood sugar and my ADD combined is a mess. All right, Laura Dean keeps breaking up with me is written by Mariko Tamaki with art by Rosemary, Rosemary Valera O'Connell. It's good. Do you want to hear more? It's book number 19 on this list for a reason, because this book is about a girl going through a breakup with her off again, on again, off again, on again girlfriend who strings her along and it's her first girlfriend, it's her first love, it's the first person that she's ever hooked up with, like had like been intimate with in any way. And she loves her, but this girl is treating her like trash. And all of her friends are like, hey, like Laura Dean is not good for you. And she's like, but I like her. I love her. I want to text her back. I want to text her first. And so she's like figuring out like how to handle that, like how to set up boundaries in your life, how to move on and discover yourself and find your own personhood outside of the way another person is treating you. Knowing my 2020, maybe you'll get why that book, it's a graphic novel, is in my top 20. I don't want to go into the messy details of my life, but yes, this graphic novel was what I needed to read this year. Okay, moving on to book number 20, which I don't need to Google or look up the author because I know it. And I said that about the last books, but then I had to look up the author. Anyway, book number 20 is actually three books that are absolutely phenomenal. And they're all graphic novels and they're in a trilogy and they're in a set. And that's March by John Lewis. And this is written by Congressman John Lewis. He tells his own story. John Lewis passed away this summer, if I recall correctly. And I knew he was like an icon of the civil rights movement. I knew he was a congressman who like fought for voting rights, like voting rights and that he was an amazing person, but I didn't know his story and like what he went through in the civil rights movement to the extent that I really should have known, but I just didn't know. So when, after he passed away and the like media around his death, a lot of people mentioned that he wrote these graphic novels for kids to like know his story today and that it was like important to him that kids like understand who he was and his legacy. So then me being a reader was like, well, I'm gonna read those graphic novels. And wow, am I glad I did because these graphic novels are deeply moving. They're beautiful. They're, their storytelling is just above and beyond like what you could ask for. And honestly, I think this is how kids need to learn history in schools today. Um, we don't need, to, we don't need random like European history. We need to read books like March about John Lewis and the civil rights like movement in America. It's three volumes and it goes up until like it tells the whole story of the civil rights movement. So it's not his life as a congressman, but his life as a civil rights activist. And y'all, if you haven't read this and if you are looking for a graphic novel to a, and a nonfiction read, because it's both, it's both a graphic novel and a nonfiction read, I would want to throw them at you, mail them to you, yell at you to go read the March graphic novels by John Lewis because you really need to read them. We made it to the end. No telling how long this video is. I think it's gonna be longer than 20 minutes though, because even though I talked about 20 books, I talked about some books for much longer than a minute. So I think this is gonna be an editing nightmare, but you know, we're gonna deal with it. And if you made it this far in the video, I applaud you, you're the best, <laughs> okay. But thank you guys for watching. I would love to hear about some of your top 20 books of 2020. You don't have to list all 20 in the comments because I just put you on the spotlight. 
spotlights on you and it is hard to come up with 20 books in the spotlight. But if you have a few that you want to talk about or if you think some of your favorites of the year were books I read, I would love to hear about it in the comments. So drop a line, tell me what books were your favorites of the year and recommend books that I should read in 2021 if your favorites did not show up in my read list this year. And thank you guys for watching. I deeply appreciate it. And you know, this has been a fun December, fun wrap up video. I have many more to do because this is only like video number seven, but you know, we've had a great time so far. So I appreciate y'all hanging around, watching these crazy long videos that I am somehow managing to do. And I will see you guys around. Sorry, you have reached a number that has been disconnected or is no longer in service.